The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. The views, information, or opinions expressed by hosts or guests are their own. Neither the show nor any of its content should be construed as investment advice or as a recommendation to buy or sell any particular security. Security-specific information shared on this podcast should not be relied upon as a basis for your own investment decisions. Be sure to do your own research. The podcast hosts and participants may have a position in the securities mentioned personally through sub-accounts and or through separate funds and may change their holdings at any time. Welcome to This Week in Intelligent Investing, where we examine timely and timeless investing topics to help you become a better investor. Enjoy authentic, unscripted discussion featuring Phil Ordway, Elliot Turner, and other thought-leading investors. Brought to you by MOI Global. And now, here's your host, John Michalczewicz. Welcome, everybody, to This Week in Intelligent Investing. Great to have you with us. Uh, great to have my co-hosts as well, Elliot Turner and Phil Ordway. We have a great show ahead. Let's get started. Phil, over to you. Thanks, John. So I'm sure you and most people probably saw the big news this week that GE is going to be breaking up into three pieces over the next couple of years. So I wanted to take that chance to talk about this idea of a conglomerate and what it means and why I think it's so patently ridiculous that people are talking about this as some sort of big deal and signifying the end of conglomerates, because I think it just misses the entire point and it's a really stupid idea. And I think there's a lot of actually really good conglomerates still out there. And I think it's a really er interesting area to focus on. Uh, but as, as by way of background, in, in case anybody hasn't seen the news, isn't familiar with the back with the backstory here. You know, GE's been a complete and utter disaster for a couple of decades now. And it's all just come to light, really. I mean, unless you weren't really paying attention in the last, call it three to four years. Um, so they announced as, as kind of a, a final step in the cleanup and the turnaround process that they're going to split into three pieces. So they're going to spin off their healthcare business in early 2023. And then they're going to spin off the recombined energy and power segment in early 2024. And the company that is remaining is going to be focused primarily in the aviation, the jet engine business. Um, and that'll be the company that, that stays behind with Larry Culp continuing to run that. But all the other, the, the other two segments will have their own boards and their own standalone corporate structures. But I, to get to this point, you really have to go back at least 20 years when Jack Welch was still running the company. And almost exactly 20 years ago in the, in the summer of 2000, GE was actually the world's most valuable company. So I was thinking about the episode we did, I don't remember how many ago it was, it was back in the first season months ago now, about the, the staying power of the top five and 10, top 20 companies in the world by market cap. And we talked about GE as kind of the poster child for things that could go wrong. And sure enough, you know, it's really, it was stunning. I mean, GE was the definition of a blue chip for many, many decades. And going up into the, the dot-com bust in 2000, it, it was literally the world's most valuable company. It had about a $600 billion market cap with a AAA credit rating in the second and third quarter of 2000. Today, it has a $120 billion market cap, which is about the same as a recent IPL. We're recording this on November 11th of 2021. GE's entire market cap today is about the same of Rivian's market cap just went public this week, a company that has no revenue, well, almost literally zero revenue. So to tell you how far GE has fallen and where things kind of stand in today's markets, that gives you a pretty good idea. But if you were to run the numbers, GE is down about 76%. That's a negative 4% a year from its peak in 2000 through today. The S&P 500 over that period has done a positive 7.4% a year. So if you'd invested $100 in GE back then, you'd have about $42 today with dividends reinvested in security versus about $458 if you'd invested in the S&P 500 dividends reinvested there. So a literally 10x difference in that simple decision you would have faced back then hypothetically. It's just kind of staggering. But really what, what undid GE, and this is, I think, what a lot of people seem to not be focusing on was just decades of horrendous capital allocation and mismanagement. I mean, I, it's still so odd to me that people had this halo effect around Jack Welch and what he did at GE and all the executives that came out of GE when it was pretty patently obvious to anybody paying attention that the company was actually very poorly managed and that he built up this super leveraged, 
private equity hedge fund Frankenstein called GE Capital that he literally referred to as the blob. It wasn't some sort of like hidden hush hush kind of Enron thing. This was all out in the open right there for anybody could, to see. And it was literally just the company's internal cookie jar so that every time one company within GE's empire had a bad quarter or a bad month, they just take money out of GE capital to kind of fluff the results and make it look better for everybody. And that's really the undoing of the whole company. So it's just kind of mind boggling to me that this is this has been cast as the end of conglomerates when it really has nothing to do with it. But here, here are some of the sound bites that I pulled from this week. An end of an era and the end of the conglomerate. In this digital economy, you have to be agile and you have to be able to more you have to be able to move quickly. You can't be burdened down in a three pontoon boat. That was a very prominent sell side note. Then there was a, a note from a, a business school professor who apparently makes a, a full time job out of studying GE and said GE is telling us based on the market's advice that smaller is better. And the rise of GE or the excuse me the rise of private equity has made M and A too competitive for GE or any other conglomerates. I think all three of those are just completely and totally dead wrong. As for the digital economy need to move fast kind of thing, it has nothing to do with the digital economy. If you want to look at for evidence of the, the feasibility, the viability, or the intelligence of pursuing a conglomerate strategy, look no further than what happened about two weeks ago when Facebook rebranded itself Metaverse. I mean, Facebook has now become a conglomerate in its own right. And if you didn't think of that in that way. I mean, look at Alphabet, right? I mean, that was what, five or six years ago now? Very much a conglomerate strategy. Amazon, very much a conglomerate strategy. Would this same sell site analyst be talking about not being able to move quickly enough because you have a three pontoon boat? I would say Amazon's almost by definition, a three pontoon boat it seems to work pretty well for them. So this really doesn't have anything to do with that. I also find it very odd that in this whole discussion about what's a conglomerate, what's not, it, this is the end of the conglomerate era or whatever, none of those articles seem to mention any any other companies but for some of the usual, like Honeywell, 3M. Occasionally, they'd throw in Roper, which, by the way, has been enormously successful and very intelligently run. Of course, nobody mentioned Berkshire in, in any of these articles, which is you know beyond bizarre, but you know goes without saying. But look around the world. I mean, SoftBank, is a conglomerate, right? I mean, that has not worked well for them, but it has nothing to do with the conglomerate structure. It has everything to do with the investment decisions they've made and the capital allocation strategies they've pursued. Toshiba, one of the biggest uh, industrial conglomerates in Asia, is actually getting pressure from activists to split up right now. United Technologies, Dupont, Siemens, they've all kind of had that moment. To a lesser extent, IBM has had that moment. But again, this has nothing to do with the conglomerate structure. It has everything to do with the even individual companies performance. And if you look back at GE specifically, I mean, again, the great mistake here was 20 or 30 years of financial mismanagement. And then when GE Capital was laid bare as an overleveraged private hedge fund, private equity vehicle internally, it took them more than a decade to unwind GE Capital. And along the way, what did they do? They made another huge, horrible conglomerate style acquisition when they bought Alstom in 2015. That required a $23 billion write-off less than three years after it was acquired. So if you look at the amount of money that they've lit on fire, it's absolutely no surprise that the market cap's down 76% in the last 20 plus years. But I mean, that's just mismanagement. It could have happened if this was a single strategy or a multi-strategy, a conglomerate, whatever. It has nothing to do with it. Conglomerates are just businesses. There is no magic here. And so I, I made a list of the key features of a successful conglomerate and an unsuccessful conglomerate. And it's literally just like business 101, two sides of the same coin kind of thing, right? A successful conglomerate will have good capital allocation. An unsuccessful conglomerate will have a misallocation of capital. They'll pursue growth for its own sake. They'll chase all these different things instead of doing you know, the, the sane, rational, long-term thing with their capital. Most good conglomerates are, have a decentralized structure without a lot of corporate bureaucracy and bloat. I think GE is notorious for its corporate bureaucracy and bloat, right? I mean, one of the things that I'll never forget was how when Jeff Immelt uh, was basically forced out in favor of Larry Culp, a few, or when Larry Culp took the job, when, when Jeff Immelt was forced out, was that it came out that Jeff Immelt was traveling with not one, but two of the you know high-end G7, whatever the biggest corporate jet he could find was, that one would fly around behind him around the world, just in case the first one had any sort of delay or mechanical problem or malfunction. I mean, think about that. It's, it's insane. A good conglomerate will have 
tax efficiency at its at its core and the capital allocation function, a, you know, a, an unsuccessful conglomerate will just continuously kind of shuffle and play gin rummy with its assets, irrespective of you know the long term most efficient thing to do. Uh, in this case, GE seemed to really pursue the wrong kind of shareholders. A, a a successful conglomerate will go out of its way to try to attract quality shareholders and try to go after strong, like-minded owners of the business. Whereas a lot of times you see conglomerates do things like, oh, well, we're, we're going after you know the broadest base investor. We're going to pay a good dividend. I mean, GE was touting its dividend and paying a dividend it couldn't afford for at least a decade until it all finally came down, right? I mean, it was a literally a house of cards when it came to the dividend. There's no chance of them being able to afford that. A good conglomerate is going to act like a long-term owner of a business. They're going to act like you would you would hope if this was their sole asset, there's a real stewardship there. I mean, John brought it up a week or two ago. The other side of the coin is you get into some sort of sclerotic co-ownership situation like the Karetsus occasionally become in, in Japan or the Chabos become in Korea, where it's really just kind of like a good old boy network almost, where I'm going to own a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and we're all just going to pretend like returns don't matter. I mean, it's, it's nonsense, right? I mean, a, a good conglomerate is about pursuing efficiency and allowing the most seamless transactions and transfers of value to occur, whereas bad conglomerates really just become completely tolerant of inefficiency, right? They almost breed inefficiency. And I think more than anything, I mean, where, where conglomerates do occasionally get some, some valid criticisms is where they lack transparency and they lack good accounting. But again, the good conglomerates all are completely transparent, all have very good reporting, all have crystal clear accounting. And GE was the poster child of the opposite, right? I mean, they literally made financial shenanigans into an art form there internally. And I think that that's often true of other conglomerates that get into trouble. Uh, so, you know, th- this isn't this isn't rocket science. I don't understand why you would paint all companies with a broad brush and say that the, the era of the conglomerate is over. I mean, it's, it's not just in the U.S. I mean, Look around at, at Foson or Tata Group or l and in India or Exor in Europe or Reliance Industries, uh, LG. I just made a list. Um, you know, certainly where Larry Culp came from here in the U.S. and Danaher has been just an unbelievable success story. Does anybody believe the era of the conglomerate's over just because Danaher kind of outgrew its size and split into a couple of parts? I mean, when it works, it really works. I think that's the key distinction for me and why it gets so much attention is when a conglomerate's successful, it's really successful. When it's not successful, it ends spectacularly. But I just view that as kind of a natural outcome of any business, right? I mean, the long-term survival rate for any business isn't all that high. And so when you add ego and leverage and you allow people to start fighting internally over their own little fiefdoms, and it becomes less about serving the customer and, and running the business well, and more about preserving this you know, sclerotic corporate body, that's when you really get into trouble. So I also think it's ironic today, and, and, and there's lessons, I think, in history from this. The last time there was a legitimate conglomerate boom was actually the 1960s. And there's some fascinating stuff to be read. We'll, we'll try to link to it in, this, in the show notes. I went back through it this morning just to kind of refresh on it. I mean, on the, on the bad side of the ledger, you had a company like LTV run by this guy, Ling, who was, you know, kind of a... a I don't know who I'd compare him to in the current era. It probably wouldn't be fair to either side, but he ran around just buying everything he possibly could like a drunken sailor. And the whole thing blew up spectacularly in his face. The stock went from a peak of $169 a share in the 1967 top for its, in its nifty 50 heyday down to $4 and 25 cents. Just three years later, he was ousted. The company actually limped along for a few more decades and finally liquidated. On the other side of the, the, the spectrum, you have Teledyne. Right. I mean, Henry Singleton's one of the single brightest business leaders we've ever had, one of the great conglomerator operators, conglomerate operators we've ever had. And, and so I don't understand why you'd ever paint everyone with the same brush. And so I do think it's funny, though, that, you know, back then, what's what fueled this whole boom was likewise kind of this mania, this popularity that seems to come and go. And it has a lot of you know commonalities with today, except today it's being expressed in other areas. Right. Private equity, SPACs, other things seem to be viewed as is better than they are, whereas conglomerates are apparently viewed as worse than they really are. So that's really, I mean, I was up on a soapbox with a lot of this, but I just think the whole, I think the GE is a fascinating example. I haven't read the book Lights Out yet, but I'm planning to read it hopefully this year over the holidays. And I think there's just so many fascinating lessons to be learned from GE 
And just like there are fascinating lessons we learned from Sears and, and plenty of others that have you know had these amazing multi-decade runs and then failed. But saying this has anything to do with the conglomerate structure is just totally and completely wrong. And I think it paints these other companies in a poor light. And so I'll, I'll end it there and ask you guys what you think about GE and the conglomerate structure and what some of your favorite conglomerates are that are that are still out there. Yeah. So, I mean, I have my own theory on why GE suffered as they have in recent years. And if you look at the month they declared they're leaving Stanford and moving to Boston, that was the post GFC high. And they're down 55% since then. And, you know, it's quite remarkable how they spent that entire year planning this move. And then the next year, their entire business, the rug was pulled out from under them. It's like, who the hell cares where you're headquartered? And they said it was about attracting better talent. Well, you know, when your company collapses 70% from there, it's not going to make a difference uh, where you're headquartered in terms of attracting talent. Like what a colossal distraction. And then you look at Charter, like a year later, Charter announced they'd build their permanent home in Stanford and that stock's more than doubled since then. So I blame it all on leaving Stanford. Um, that's what did them in. Um, maybe, a, you know, home bias, whatever. Um, but in all seriousness, you know, I think, uh, there is some truth to the fact that they were focused on all the wrong things and they were thinking about all the wrong things. That acquisition of Alstom, when you were talking about like, when you, when you mentioned that phrase about M&A being too competitive, like no one forced them to go in a, into a bidding war against Siemens where it actually made sense to have the asset, um, to go into a bidding war and then not even integrate it well. Like that was a choice. Um, why'd they do it? Who the hell knows? It's hard to know now, but um you know, you you could complain about M and A being too competitive, but you kind of make your own bed uh, when you do such things. Um, and you know, this whole idea that the era of the conglomerate is over, um, I think that's a headline that should have been written in the seventies or eighties. I I, don't, I hardly feel like we've had a conglomerate era. If anything, you know, spinoffs have been far more the rage. Deglomeration has been far more prominent for at least a couple decades than has been conglomeration. Um, so I know maybe the phrase can mean whatever you want it to mean. Um, and I think to the extent that you pointed out some really good examples today with companies like Facebook, well, Meta and Alphabet, um, those are absolutely conglomerates by most standards. You know, I think when you invoke Singleton, I think that's spot on. But the beauty of it was that he was like, he, he, he was both a conglomerator and a deglomerator, if that's exactly. the word. You know, and so that gets me to my favorite conglomerate. It's, it's IAC. You know, they're builders, but they're not builders to own things forever. They're builders to then give things their own wings and set them free and then restart the process again. Um, so I think it's a pretty beautiful model. And I think it's really interesting. Yeah, that's a great point, by the way, too, about how they they actually were writing a lot about the end of the conglomerates in the 1980s, because to your point, like, you know, a lot of those conglomerates from the 60s didn't last. And so by the 80s, it had gone on to something new and shinier. And so it was the end of the conglomerates. And think about how dumb it would have been to say in 1985, like, boy, the era of the conglomerates over, I'm not going to look at this Berkshire Hathaway thing. Like, <laughs> Nothing could be dumber, right? And like the same thing is true today. You're right. I mean, IAC is a conglomerate. We were getting to this, by the way, a little bit last week. We were talking about the internal investment function that I think a lot of companies should consider starting because it just makes so much sense. And a lot of people took that to mean a conglomerate. And then they very correctly brought up this notion of the conglomerate discount. And look, that's true. There's plenty of empirical evidence that conglomerates are going to trade at a 10, 12, 15% discount to their net asset value, to the so-called sum of the parts. And that's fine. But again, my response to that would be, who cares? If you have a good operator, a good corporate governance system, a good structure in place, and a good business or multiple businesses under one umbrella, and it trades 10% cheap, I should be excited about that. Why would I care if that, if that gap persists forever, if the business itself is making progress? And I bought it intelligently, right? I mean, it literally makes absolutely no difference to me. And if I had to pick between having a stock that's 10% undervalued and 10% overvalued, I know which side I'd fall on, right? And so whether it's IEC, which is a great one, or XOR over in Europe, which I think falls under the same category sometimes, I mean, those are intriguing, well-managed businesses, in my opinion. And whether you call them a conglomerate or not is completely irrelevant. And I think what all the great conglomerates have in common, the ones that we've mentioned here, you know, I've I had in the past been involved with XOR as well. 
you know, Berkshire, when you mentioned Sing- Singleton as well, um, the Rails Brothers with Danaher, um, all of these groups were focused both on, you know, growing and shrinking and had different strategies for each side of things and recognized the environment when it was time to grow and when it was time to shrink. And, um, you know, I think when they wrote those first wave of articles about the end of the conglomerate era, the big lesson was that every company had been focused on growing in perpetuity and you just can't do that. And you think about a company like Valiant, who was, you know, part roll up conglomerate may be wrong because they weren't exactly like in separate verticals, though they did cast a very wide uh, net within one uh, industry. You know, what went wrong is they had to keep growing with the same strategy that they had been growing with. And there was no situational awareness. There was no general asking of oneself, like introspectively, does this environment reward the same things that got me here? And, you know, I think that's one of the most important things every investor should ask themselves. That's part of investing in general, having this like, you know, lick your fingers, stick it up in the air, figure out which way the wind's blowing a little bit and what's, you know, important. Um, It's part of what, you know, we'd talked about with uh, generally understanding yourself as an investor. Um, GE was the opposite, like overpaying for Alstom at exactly the wrong time. I mean, I mean, I think that's one of the key things that did themselves in. And I'll still blame the headquarters anyway. Yeah, I'll jump in. I think, Phil, you know, what you mentioned just touches on what we see a lot, which is just simplistic stories being pushed in in the media and also by the sell side often. Um, It reminds me a little, you know, saying that this is the end of conglomerates reminds me a little bit of that Francis Fukuyama line, uh, end of history, which <laughs> we know wasn't quite the end of history. Um, don't have a ton to say on GE. I think the, the thing that upsets me the most uh, with regard to the GE story is just how much recognition uh, and awe was sent uh, Jack Welsh's way for decades, probably. And, um, you know, he, um, he really made a killing for himself also during that period and has his name on, I think, a bunch of institutions when actually he should probably go down as one of the worst capital allocators and not one of the best. Um, I think in terms of examples, you guys have touched on some good ones like Berkshire, Exor, obviously, Bolloré, another one in Europe that that could be uh, called a conglomerate. Uh, there's a smaller company in the U.S. Uh, called IDT. Uh, Howard Jonas runs that, has done pretty well over a long period of time. They're, they're a little bit like a poor man's IAC, I would say. They also tend to incubate some businesses and spin them off and so forth. What I think is really interesting are kind of more in- industry focused conglomerates like um you know alphabet amazon um maybe constellation software can in some ways be viewed as a conglomerate or if you want um in terms of kind of luxury consumer brands lvmh uh, might be considered a conglomerate uh, maybe even on the real estate uh, kind of hard asset side brookfield um, and those are all uh, really well-run uh, companies over time. So um, a few thoughts from me. Yeah, no, it's a good point. And I think it's where it gets so arbitrary is, you know, it, Brookfield is definitely a conglomerate when you look at the number of different things it owns, but because it all kind of falls under the realm of quote-unquote infrastructure a lot of times or real estate, they don't seem to get lumped in with 3M or Danaher or whatever. And it's just, you know, my point would be, I, I guess – a conglomerate structure can be like leverage in a sense almost because it can magnify the good and the bad, right? So in cases like GE, where it's clearly propped up by financial engineering, it almost gives you more runway to hide the decline and the malfeasance because you're just taking from one pocket and putting it in the other, right? You're stealing from one side and and reimbursing the other to just kind of mask the overall decline of the, of the corporate entity whereas it would be a little bit clearer. I also find it equally ridiculous, by the way, when people say like, oh, well, you shouldn't have a conglomerate strategy because investors prefer 
clarity and transparency and focus, and we're going to have a disciplined capital allocation strategy and all these buzzwords that people throw around. I mean, that's nonsense too, right? I mean, some of the best managed, most transparent, most focused companies that I've ever seen are in a conglomerate structure. So it really doesn't have anything to do with that. I mean, saying that investors prefer you know, quote unquote, pure plays is about as dumb as saying that, you know, investors prefer dividends. Like, no, you should pay a dividend because it's the right decision and it's what the situation calls for. And you should be a quote unquote, pure play if that's what makes sense for this business and this industry at this point in time, not because that's what investors prefer. Investors prefer you doing what makes sense for the business and the customers it's serving. And that's really the end of it. It shouldn't be a whole lot more complicated than that. So I am interested though, and I'll leave it at this. Um, if folks want to chime in with other examples of well-run, I mean, I'm not in the short selling business. I, the, the, the poorly run businesses are, are good teaching exercises, but I am interested in some of the smaller conglomerates that are out there that have managed to fend off this it's a little bit of pessimism that may, maybe is out there in the market because it just seems like there's so much runway ahead of them. And I'm sure I'm missing some good examples. So uh, with that, I'll pass it back over to you, John. Great. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, good discussion. Let's uh, go over to Elliot. All right. I want to talk about the Kasparov principle uh, named after, or I don't, I don't think he dubbed it himself, but the chess player, the world grandmaster. And what Kasparov phrased the principle as is human plus machine plus superior process is the key. So the idea is that human plus machine beats either human or machine. And this was essentially his main takeaway after the experience of competing against Deep Blue. So as it stands today, humans can no longer beat computers like great, great humans can no longer beat the most powerful computers at chess. It's not even close anymore. But a great human chess player with a fairly modestly powered computer can dominate the best machines, the best computers in the world. So the way Kasparov phrased this is that people bring the strategy, machines bring the tactics. My first exposure to the phrase was my long-term investment in InvestNet, where the company's visionary founder, this gentleman, Judd Bregman, who died tragically a couple of years ago, um, he would talk about building tools to empower advisors to build their practices, like in investment advisors, so that they could build their practices around this principle, that powering advisors with machines to do some of the more commodified parts of the job would let advisors focus on the more important parts uh, that they could do well themselves that required a human touch, especially in an industry where, you know, emotion and dealing with it is something that's pretty important. So the entire idea was born out of Kasparov's battles uh, with Deep Blue. And he talked about his own, Kasparov has since talked about his own evolution uh, where, you know, when he was in those fights, he actually called himself a skeptic of AI's abilities and its promise down the line um, to the point where now he fully embraces the idea that we should find opportunities where humans can work together with machines to create superior outcomes. Um, so he emphasizes the upsides and there are uniquely brilliant moments for humans where it happens, but it's also not so easy. So what got me thinking a lot about this recently like I, I settled on the topic for this week after reading an article in Business Insider about Zillow's uh, exiting of the iBuying business. If you listen to Zillow's call, they gave a lot of blame on their models and how hard it is to build the models and you know humans throwing their damn machines under the bus. Uh, but in this Business Insider article, they talked about how it was actually not a model mistake at all. It was the fault of this project called Project Ketchup, like you know, after Heinz, like Heinz ketchup, to be a play on the word catch up, the words catch up, where they set the ambition of having as much inventory as open door. And so in this project catch up, they decided to make their own models, they being the humans, to make their own models more aggressive to, to justify paying more for given homes. Um, and so, you know, the literal quote from the article was that employees' accounts suggested that Zillow's eye-buying problems had less to do with a glitch in its computer-driven algorithmic approach 
to purchasing homes are unpredictable swings in prices and more to do with the over exuberance of human managers. And that's one of the areas, you know, Kasparov's focused optimistically on where um, you have these uniquely brilliant moments for humans with machines. But, you know, humans have some of these behavioral biases that we talked about many times and over over exuberance is one of the specific ones. Um, But it's interesting to think about how, you know, a more optimized version I think part of the problem is that the people managing the models at Zillow were not people in position to, they they were not like what you'd call boots on the ground in the real estate industry with immense knowledge of what the buying and selling process was like and what you should be doing. They were uh, people who were running a web platform designed to bring eyeballs in and to sell ads to real estate agents. So, you know, they probably could have put the model in the hands of people who are more capable and adept at managing it, and perhaps they would have had a better outcome. Another company I think about where, you know, they really do leverage this idea of human plus machine equal better outcome, though there is some friction at the moment, is Stitch Fix. The entire premise of Stitch Fix is that you get a box of five items that you haven't seen. These items were selected by a stylist who was given algorithmically a array of selection of an assortment that you as a person should, as a customer should like. And so the stylists were given some discretion to use what makes humans uniquely powerful. So I want to list a few of the forces that I think where humans do best alongside machines. And these are borrowed from Kasparov, from a couple of my own observations and, you know, reading about the topic generally, there's a great HBR article about it. Um, So humans are unique for creativity, intuition, improvisation. Um, I found the improvisation one funny because it's like, I I, I love this idea that oftentimes your greatest strengths are also your greatest weaknesses because, you know, Kasparov himself, I'm not a a chess player, so I can't say, I I don't know enough about like which game or what exactly it was that threw him off. But um, he has talked about how there was one game where Deep Blue's opening move was so mind blowing and head scratching and he had no clue what was going on where he got lost in his own head overthinking the magnitude and the meaning of it and what it might have identified about him. Um, And that was, I think the first game he had lost uh, to the machine. So, you know, improvisation, you you throw someone off their game and he improvised the wrong way Uh, though. It is one of our great strengths. Um, Those are strength traits uh, like creativity, intuition, and improvisation. You can't program them. The other area that I think, you know, humans are uniquely well-suited and empowered, especially when you could kind of find context where it's important and you add that to a machine is uh, social and emotional intelligence. Um, And, you know, there are certain sides to it where um, we can't fight our our own emotions, but we can recognize social context and we can recognize emotion in other people. Um, So I think what I wanted to do is ask you guys two things. And I want to ask the audience at large. So I hope you all come at us with some of your answers to this as well. Um, But so first, what are some areas where it's clear human plus machine works better than either or? Um, And then second, can you think of any companies built around the idea of empowering humans with machines to be better than either in isolation? So I'm curious what you guys think. I'll have to think about the second one. Uh, I mean, the first one, yeah, areas that, uh, are better where humans plus machine work together. Uh, I think that two of my favorite topics certainly fall in this category for sure, which is investing in sports. I mean, I think it's beyond reproach now that investing is better done with a, what I call a quantitative plus qualitative kind of framework. I mean, I, don't, I personally would never want to remove the human judgment, the human element from all investment decisions. There are some things that just can't be quantified. But at the same time, if you're not quantifying as much as you possibly can and putting it in the proper context, you're missing out on a lot of things and you're probably going to be swaying too much to the tune of emotions rather than data and facts such as they exist. So investing is an easy one. And likewise, uh, sports, I mean, I think it also goes without saying that over the last 20 years or so, you've seen a revolution in the way many sports are played. And that's largely because of this human plus uh, machines kind of framework. And, I, you know, it goes back really to scouting, which is a lot like, you know, particularly early stage, but really all forms of investing, right? When you're looking at a player, 
and trying to make a decision about whether that player would be a good addition to draft or sign to the team, you're making all sorts of inferences, right? You have to draw on all sorts of data sources to predict the future and, and fill in the blanks for all the unknowns that there are. And a lot of human only scouts reason by analogy in that world, right? I think it's just fascinating when you look at somebody like, uh, I know they've, they've fallen out of repute now, but what the Houston Rockets used to do where they'd say, look, you're not allowed to make an analogy. You're not allowed to compare player A to player B because it's just such a lazy way of thinking. And if you're going to do it, you have to switch up, you know, kind of the, the basic frameworks that people are going to immediately use in their analogies, like height and weight or race or whatever the case may be, because it just traps your brain into this very lazy frame of mind. And it's suboptimal. Whereas if you use a lot of data, in your scouting and use that to set the base rate, it's just a much, much smarter way to do it. So, and that, that applies to all sorts of different games, uh, not just, you know, the, the team sports that we're all familiar with, but th those are two obvious ones that jump out to me. And I think it's a fascinating topic. I certainly agree. I hadn't really thought about it in the context of Stitch Fix, but I guess the whole company was really founded on that the Kasparov principle, right? The premise that human plus machine is better than either one standalone. So that, that's that's an excellent point. I mean, as for the Zillow thing, you know, it, it is fascinating. I agree. I haven't read that article that you referenced, Elliot, but it certainly seems to me that this has much more to do with humans programming a bad model rather than a model gone wrong or something like that. And that is, I guess, if I had to push back with anything here, that is often where I see this stuff get misapplied in, in finance. I think I've told the story before where one of the qualitative portfolio level models we used at my old firm back in the financial crisis uh, really would have led us astray into taking a ton of risk in the summer of 2007. And then again, in the summer of 2008, kind of a second bite at the apple that would have really ruined things uh, if human judgment hadn't been able to come in as an override. So that's why I think you, there's an, there's an, and there's an ampersand there, right? You have to have both sides of it. So. Yeah. I think those are two great examples, John, how about you? What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I have a few examples, but not, not really that many, but I think the question is really fascinating. I think what, what I'm kind of wondering about is whether this human plus machine is an interim solution that's better or is this going to be the case forever uh, in other words is ai ever going to get so powerful that humans can't add anything and i think that's kind of the scary part uh for us is uh is if we really cannot add anything um and and so if you take chess as an example and i don't know what's true today uh if it's still true that human plus machine is is better or if chess has actually been solved quote unquote uh by machines where they can literally um you know computers are so powerful that they can see every move uh that's possible uh, till the end of the chess game uh, so i don't know where we stand on that i think the game go is even more complex than chess and and i'm pretty sure in that one it's still the case that human plus machine is superior and it may well still be in chess, but I'm not sure. I think in terms of examples, I mean, you know, one of the reasons you've seen costs uh, go up at Facebook, well, one of the smaller ex uh, reasons, I guess, is uh, the human moderators they've had to hire uh, to kind of weed out some of the the worst content being posted on Facebook. I think that's an example of, you know, machine plus human doing a better job than just machine. I think generally it's a tough business model. I mean, if it works, it can work well, but you I, I feel like you're always at the in danger of someone coming along and doing the same thing without humans just as well. And if that happens, then you're left with a higher cost structure and kind of may get blown out of the water. Um, you know, the, the thing with Z what happened with Zillow, I think that was just a case of setting the wrong incentives and having the wrong goals. It's kind of like if you compensate your insurance underwriters based on market share, you're going to get a bunch of bad uh, underwriting. So it sounds like that was mainly uh, what went on there. I think other examples, I think uh, an interesting one is is uh, 
some of the CAPTCHA systems out there where basically humans in, in filling in these CAPTCHAs, they were helping machines, I think, digitize old books uh, or something along that those lines. Um, and then in terms of just thinking much farther ahead, uh, what are humans uniquely well-suited for? And Elliot, you talked about this. Uh, empathy is the one that I always keep coming back to. I think it's going to be very hard for machines to have the empathy of humans. And, uh, you know, maybe at some point that is the value that, that we're going to be adding, uh, in a world that, that's moving more and more toward, um, AI and machine learning. Yeah, those are just some great examples. Really good. And, you know, I had actually written down next to Zillow, the problem was incentives, not humans or models. And I didn't say the word incentives, but that's one we keep coming back to. And that's so spot on. They were geared toward optimizing for the wrong thing, um, not what the human plus ma machine should have been trying to do. Um, this notion of empathy as being uniquely human. Um, I think it comes along with, you know, social and emotional intelligence, and you could maybe just broaden the scope of that. But I like that you added the word empathy, because I think that is one where no matter how a machine with AI evolves, you know, you ask the question, will AI get there eventually and being able to do some of these uh, more human things? Um, that doesn't strike me as likely, uh, at least based on what we know about where it's going and what it's capable of doing. Um, but it could probably mimic some degree of humanity and humanness to us. Um, so that's, um, you know, different than actually internalizing it. I am a little surprised more companies haven't been built around these principles in general. Like I recognize the idea that perhaps you end up with a bloated cost structure and whatever you could automate, you would. Um, but, you know, it makes sense that Stitch Fix is an area where, um, human plus machine was the starting point. Stylistically speaking, you do need a degree of like human connection. Uh, taste is something that you, one would think is inherently human. Although I wonder if there are AI efforts at like recipe generation built on scraping historical recipes and finding connections between certain flavors and building models for that. <laughs> As I say, taste is inherently human. Um, but also, Phil, I'm glad you said investing in sports because, you know, I, I had the topic once about the book MVP Machine, and I think that was one of the big lessons in sports where they went too far empowering their models and realized there were gaps in being able to recognize skills where you could then layer on some of the lessons you have around optimizing individual performance, like in a more automated way and bring out the best in certain people. And I wonder if there are other areas, uh, other industries that are involved with surfacing ideas where that sort of process and approach could be uh, deployed and investing right on. I was like waiting to, I wasn't necessarily gonna say that myself, but investing is one of those areas where there are some people who've deployed it really well. And I think there are increasingly interesting applications though one of the hardest parts is sifting out uh, noise and what, to feed your model. So I think that's an inherently human uh, endeavor within it. Yeah, I, I agree. Cause I, I just, I, John's question's interesting, right? I don't know. I certainly won't even try to answer the great question of whether or not we're going to give rise to true artificial intelligence, intelligence with a capital I in the sense that it could like become all knowing and function on its own and, you know, kill us or take over the world from us or something like that. It, that. That's obviously a great question. I just don't have anything to add on that topic. As for it pertains in a narrower, more benign sense to this conversation, I don't think you'll ever get to a point where this is an interim step just because of all the things you just mentioned. I mean, empathy is a great point, but I mean, to take it back down even to a simpler level, right? I mean, incentives, like we all just said, it, it's, it's really hard to model psychology. Humans are messy, they're unpredictable sometimes, they're emotional. It's, it's very difficult. I mean, this is where the best models, whether it's LTCM or something else, the best models can't account for human behavior, particularly human behavior in crowds. And that's really what matters in a lot of businesses. And so I, I just don't think you're ever going to get away from that. And even, even more prosaically in the, in the context of sports, let's say, if you're trying to design a team you can certainly use human plus machine and rely on the machine to make far better decisions. 
But I think we'd all agree, no matter how hard nosed and analytical nerd you might be, that you know things like leadership and chemistry and personality still matter. And if you assemble a team where you pay no attention to that, you're going to do a poorer job than you would be if you took you know that into consideration. So it, it just seems like there's no escaping the human element across any of those boundaries. But I am fascinated on a, on a related note to other companies that are going to be developed and run along these lines. I mean, I think Netflix has certainly been run partially along these lines for a long time. I mean, they ran that contest years ago to see who could develop the best recommendation algorithm. And to your point, Ellie, that is kind of like scraping for recipes or, or trying to define taste because what movie you like is going to be different than what movie I like and what everybody else likes. And it's a very personal thing. So how do you get that algorithm tuned as close as you can possibly get? And that's a very difficult, very subjective exercise that's never going to achieve true perfection, right? To the point of John's question about getting to an all-knowing algorithm there. I don't think that's really possible because, you know, what movie I like may even change from day to day. How would an algorithm really you know, capture my mood or what I'm interested in watching at a given time. So it just doesn't seem like it's really possible. But I do think that curation of choices, you know, as we've gone from an era of scarcity to an era of abundance, I mean, I think that's why something like Stitch Fix would have a place there because it, it's just there's too many choices out there, right? The, the paradox of choice is that if you have more than two or three or four choices to make, sometimes your brain just kind of melts down and doesn't know how to respond and it certainly can't make a good decision or, or take action on it. So having a curation engine that can limit those choices and present them to you in a usable manner is a really, really valuable thing. Yeah, I'll jump in real quick. Um, Phil, I, I, you know, when you s talked about algorithm, I, I was thinking of the YouTube algorithm and, and how scarily good it actually is. I mean, uh, it, it kind of surfaces videos that I end up watching, but would not have actually searched for myself. And and an example going back to kind of the early days of of the web, the Yahoo um, search engine, or or better word, web directory, was kind of a. I think there was human input into the making of the the Yahoo directory, and uh, it kind of got blown out of the water by the concept of search and and Google. And I'm pretty sure that Google really tries to have everything run by algorithms without human input. So it's a, it's a big question. I think for in, as far as investing goes, um, I agree that human plus machine is, is the best and will probably stay that way. Although there are areas of investing that I think will go machine only where it's super you know, quantitative or kind of simplistic types of uh, investing styles or things that can be tested on, um, you know, a lot of data. Uh, but in investing, you know, some of the biggest gains or losses occur at times when uh, there are big swings in the market, um, things change on a macro scale, and uh, models are not good at predicting things for which there's not a lot of data. And uh, so I think, or, or as you said, Phil, um, you know, kind of human emotions, greed and fear. I mean, how's, you know, how are machines um, going to predict greed and fear? Um, they're probably better at not being fearful. But at the end of the day, um, you know, humans might uh, jump in and override that. Yeah, no, I think those are like interesting questions, too, because when you look at what the models are designed to do. I think when we talk about something like YouTube in contrast to investing, with YouTube, what you're speaking about is like an optimization function where you're trying to find the perfect fit for a person. With investing, it's a competitive function and it's more zero sum in its potential outcome. And you need humans to watch each for like different things. So like right now we're facing the question, um, is there like a morality behind YouTube's model that's inherently flawed? And there's no machine that could inevitably be the arbiter of that. And so you need to have people battle out, like to what extent do you need to inject um, new thinking into or, or incorporate new flow of ideas, a new flow of content into the model 
So you don't just very narrowly steer someone down a tunnel. Um, and then investing, you have like these competitive playing fields where you could end up with, you know, I love the Andrew Lowe paper on the quant meltdown, where all these models are effectively doing the same thing without realizing that they're competing with one another and too much capital gets pulled in them and they make each other fail, right? Everyone fails together when they all felt that they were each winning uh, individually. Um, and so humans have to be sitting there at the dial trying to assess some of these questions like, are these things happening in an optimizing function? Am I optimizing for the wrong thing? Has my optimization gone too far? Is it too narrow? Um, should I be injecting some degree, uh, something that's new, some, some degree of newness to it? Um, when I've done a lot of calls on Stitch Fix, one of the things people say that they do have some churn uh, in, in their customer base from is that the model's designed to be more down the middle and capture like the mainstream of taste. But once you kind of fill your wardrobe with that, you're probably going to want to be filling the fringes, not the uh, core. So, you know, those are tough questions that you have to ask. For competitive ones, you do have to be very conscious of like when everyone's doing the money ball strategy and every player's three true outcome and you've given up on speed, you know, have to ask this. So you need a human to ask the question, should I get a little speed in there to create some dynamism. I remember the Royals destroying my Mets in the World Series in 2015 because their speed just wreaked havoc on our ability to like function as a team. It, it, it changed the mentality of the entire game. Um, so yeah, no, I think uh, you guys raised some really good points and it got me thinking about this distinction between these two kinds of models. I, I feel like that should matter a lot. Got to be some more good companies too. We'll have to circle back with some more examples we can think of. And the audience, help us out. I'd love to hear some more. We got some good answers uh, a couple weeks ago when we asked for co when when we asked for companies that were doing um, you know very low cost of something much bigger. So hit us with your ideas. Yeah, definitely. And Elliot, great point there on uh, on on these uh, on the distinction between competitive um i i feel like it's it's also such a profound statement that you made elliot on machines really having no values and you know the youtube algorithm will will lead you down a rabbit hole and um but what values is it really you know trying to trying to Im imbue society with and i think that's also part of this whole question around um you know who gets to decide those values because machines are just going to do whatever kind of optimizes for what they're given which is um you know time spent uh, on youtube let's say um and you know who should who should decide on those values is it is it all of us or is it just uh the shareholders of those companies is it just the management i think those are all big questions that you know, we're, we're not going to resolve now, but I think uh, as a society, we're going to have to deal with those for, for a long time to come. Guys, thank you so much for another uh, great discussion. And thanks, everyone, for listening. See you soon. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to This Week in Intelligent Investing, brought to you exclusively by MOI Global, the research-driven membership organization. Learn more at moiglobal.com.